became uh, really our primary work uh, beginning back in 2013 here in the Noble Local School District. So I'm anxious to talk about the importance of connecting kids to careers, uh, guiding students uh, in an effort to help them discover and find their why, and also the importance of schools in this mission and actually uh, revitalizing our state and, and what we can do to, to enhance economic growth and development, not only in our local areas, our region, but also our entire state. Uh, I will tell you that I don't think COVID has changed a thing. Matter of fact, I think there's never been a greater need for us than now to connect students to their why. You know, in all this uncertainty, uh, how we guide students, uh, how we leverage our students to help our local employers, all those things are just key. So we're gonna touch on a few of those things, uh, but a few housekeeping things. Uh, I will try to monitor the chat feature uh, to the best of my ability. So if you have a question, uh, I plan on allowing some time afterwards for some questions. I also understand that in a reasonable amount of time, I will try to cover a lot. Uh, so if there's something that you want to discuss afterwards, I'll certainly uh, be available to do that and, and love it. So um, use the chat feature. We'll communicate back and forth the best we can. So I, guess, I was going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat as well, Dan. So uh, okay. don't worry too much about that. Great, great. So back in March, obviously, when the shutdown occurred, uh, we all had to face great uncertainty. I want to start today with a story of my mother, actually. And my mother would probably kill me for saying this, but my mom is 77 years old. And about five or six years ago, she picked up a career as realtor. And uh, she lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And on Twitter, on Twitter, I realized that my mom was one of the top five realtors in the Chattanooga area. And even since COVID, her sales were up 38%. And I thought, wow, my mom is just rocking it. And I want to talk to her. I want to tell her how proud I am. So I asked my mom, I said, mom, what do you, what do you attribute your success to? And my mom says, number one, it's about mindset with a focus on the customer, identifying who those customers are, and having the mindset that you're going to wake up every day and serve them to the best of your ability. Automatic connection to educators. Who are our customers? Our primary customers are students, but also our customers are those business and industry partners in our area that are dependent upon our students to provide their future workforce. The second key that my mother, that my mother uh, told me was her key was what you focus on expands. And, and I think that's very simplistic, but the fact that if you if you provide focus and you provide support and you align your resources uh, to meet those priorities, uh, your results expand. And I think that's key. And her third her third key to success was never take your foot off the accelerator. At seventy seven years of age, my mom's telling me that the third key to her success is never take your, take your foot off the accelerator. So when I think about those three keys in relation to what we heard Nick Akins from AEP talk about this morning when he mentioned customer-focused innovation. If you think about pre-COVID and during COVID, what we need is customer-based innovation. We spent so much time talking about how dreadful this is. We hate all the change. Uh, boy, it's not the way that it used to be. It's not the way things have always been done. And we think about the mindset and how we gravitate to the way things have always been done. Pre-COVID, business and industry needed us to create customers for them that were innovative, creative, a workforce that, that's able to think differently and problem solve differently. COVID has actually served as the magnifying glass for this. You know, so the weaknesses that we had pre-COVID have only been magnified. But it certainly hasn't, re uh, you know, reduced the need for us to accelerate our service to our customers and, and, and create graduates that are ready to be the workforce that our future employers need. So I, I think that's really interesting to hear him say that and to compare to what my mother um, shared with a group of realtors throughout the state in Chattanooga. I think there's a lot of overlap. There's also some great messages there into how we need to be able to use this opportunity to reset 
you know, the governor and, and the Ohio Department of Education has called fall 2020 a chance to reset and re restart. I think it's a great opportunity for us to do the same. So a little bit about our district. Um, Noble Local School District is 289 square miles without a stoplight. We're located in Noble County, approximately two hours east of Columbus, about an hour north of Marietta, and about two hours south of Cleveland. So we're in the eastern, southeastern part. Uh, I've just concluded my seventh year here, and I think our district has seen a huge transformation uh, during this past seven years, and it all has to do with our work around career connections and career pathways. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story. And please, as a follow-up, whether we get to it today or in the future, you want to have conversations, our team, uh, our team would welcome you here. Uh, we would welcome the conversation. But in 2013, we had a declining enrollment, many negative markers uh, that we could point to, whether it was the, point, uh, the report card, various demographic data, but maybe the most alarming uh, detail about that time was how you would hear so many people, uh, great people, people that loved our kids would, would occasionally in a conversation say, but our kids, you know, but our kids. So you would be engaged in this great, exciting conversation and someone would say, but our kids, as if our kids were predisposed to something less uh, than kids in other parts of the state. So we started immediately thinking, how are we going to, how are we going to change this mindset? We felt like that there was complete loss of hope. We felt like that geographically we were we were predisposed to limited access and opportunities. In 2014, we also realized that there was a huge gap between future employers and their needs and our graduating seniors and what they knew to be available as opportunities in our community. So at that point in time, we really started to shape and we started to visit you know, how are we going to increase hope, access, and opportunities within our district. So uh, shortly after uh, 2014, we visited Gulfport, Mississippi. We wanted to see what was happening in Gulfport in their response to rebuilding their community uh, in a post-Hurricane Katrina world. And what we found there, what we landed on there has been ever-changing in our district because we saw the most simplistic of mission statements where the mission statement simply read, all roads lead to a J-O-B. And so when we started to think about how are we going to create hope, access, and opportunity in our district that's so rural and so void uh, of opportunities, you know, nearby, we thought that we were going to do that through pathways and partnerships. We felt like that there was no greater way than to build hope than to build alliances, build collaboration build partnerships where our kids could be exposed to these are the opportunities right here in your backyard and here's what's needed to access those opportunities uh, in 2013 we had zero business and industry partners today our school district works uh, regularly with over 160 different business and industry partners to provide this access uh, this hope and opportunity for our students we also knew that to prepare the workforce that our students were, were going to need uh, to, to be able to help and, and, and provide uh, uh, the workforce that our area employers needed, we needed to align our curriculum and our course offerings and our resources. So all of our infrastructure improvements, all the things that we have done have really been designed to support our local business and industry partners. And therefore, we've created the graduate that can immediately be prepared for what their needs are. So one great example is we're remodeling our 1963 high school and we were, we were prepared to bring back the welding program, the metal shop to our high school. A lot of people have, have gotten rid of their metal shops, but it's important in our area. And, and our local uh, employers are saying, we really need people that know how to work with metal and that can weld. We began our lab design and our local industry partner actually helped us design what equipment went into that lab so that our kids could walk right out of this door and be prepared for an opportunity in their com company. So we talk about aligning, setting priorities, then aligning our resources 
uh, to match that. We also know that 90% of the jobs in our region and state will be STEM related. And you also heard uh, Mr. Akins talk about this this morning, the importance of STEM. And uh, actually we've worked very hard to create a STEM culture uh, in our district. So it's more than science, technology, engineering, and math. We really think uh, we look at it and we'll continue to look at it as strategies that engage the mind. In our area, when we discuss STEAM, uh, the A also means arts, but for us, agriculture uh, is a driving force in our community. So we recently purchased uh, in, in the process of developing a 136 acre farm that we're going we're gonna to operate in conjunction with the Ohio State University Research Farm and all of our community partners. So that experiments that may be taking place uh, across the county at OSU, we might be able to replicate that and compare data and comparative results. So we're really looking at STEM, but STEAM, but that culture of, you know, strategies that engage the mind because we want problem solvers. We want people to think differently and work collaboratively and be able to do uh, those kind of things. We currently employ both a career pathway specialist and a pathways to graduation coach. So this is typically when I get the questions, well, you must have some money. You're able to add this position or that position. What we've really done a very good job of, in my opinion, is we've evaluated those programs that still had great meaning and usefulness, and we've traded those programs that were somewhat ineffective with things that we really felt like were more relevant to our students and our community's future. So we've added those positions uh, while reducing positions in other areas of our operation. Again, not everything can be a priority, but we really think guidance and support for our students moving through these pathways and making these connections with local business and industry uh, is really key. One of the strongest forces in our school district is our 55 member business and advisory council that includes state representatives and also representation from the Lieutenant Governor's office. And we typically meet at least four times a year, but the feedback that we get from that committee is critical and how we shape and create opportunities for our students. And we really look at that partnership as not what we can get from business advisory council members, but also what can we give uh, them in return. So for example, going back to our welding lab, our space becomes our capital. And if there's a local employer that needs another facility to help upskill or train uh, some of their workforce, then we make our space available and we provide that opportunity. As we've realigned our mission to, to meet uh, both our customers being business and industry as well as our students, we see a lot of markers. We're seeing a lot of markers change. So for example, in 2013, we were minus 57 in open enrollment. To today, we're plus 200. So that's a 257 uh, student swing. Our report card and our growth measures have increased significantly. Our preschool in 2013 had 19 students attending preschool. Today, we're nearly 120. And if you really want to get serious about workforce development and creating, creating a, a graduate, a product that local employers can use, really have to, you really have to take a look at pre-K access, especially in areas like ours. So expanding pre-K has been huge. Uh, we also use a rubric. It's started at our high school this past year. Uh, we call it the 3R rubric. It's ready, responsible, respectful. It's aligned with the Ohio Means Jobs Readiness Seal rubric, and it's feedback that we can give students and parents beyond their traditional grade card. And I think it's really important that we start shaping uh, and describing those behaviors that our employers need, those behaviors that we want to see in the school system and really aligning that with that, that career development piece. So uh, we're looking forward to hopefully expanding use of that rubric uh, even in our pre-K through eight building. We think that's going to be huge. We used to have many students that left our campus for CCP options. And, you know, we really felt it important not to limit that exposure, but increase access, bring as many of those courses to our campus as possible. Thanks to a great partner in Zane State College, uh, we currently offer over 120 hours of uh, CCP credit on our campus, 
And we now have more students that leave our campus for pre-apprenticeships than we have leave for College Credit Plus. So providing that access, providing those opportunities right here on our campus has really been key. So we're excited about that and we look forward to not just continuing that, but ramping that up in a post-COVID world because our business and industry partners are saying, we need you to ramp it up. So we, we, we're really excited about taking that next step and that's a, that's a whole nother uh, discussion. So let's think about some of the things that I think our students and future employers need in this post-COVID world. We've already talked about the STEM and STEAM, strategies that engage the mind. Upper level math and science for all. You know, for a while we were trapped in that world where we, we said college for all. Everybody needs college. I think we know that that's not true. I think that we know that, that we really, that pendulum swung really way too far to that college side. But the one thing that we've discovered is that all kids do need upper level coursework. They need college level reasoning and mathematical skills regardless their chosen trade. So think about, think about when kids come back to your building and we are preparing for a five day a week return to school on September uh, 8th. Kids come into our building. They've not been in our school since March 12th. And we think about the fact that kids are going to come back to us with many gaps, unknown gaps. We, we don't really know today what the extent of those gaps are. Uh, will be. But we know this, if we want to provide equity, and equity in a future for all of our kids, we know, we know that they're going to have to have rigorous coursework in ELA and math and science. So how do we assess those gaps? How do we differentiate while also looking to accelerate? So if you think about one of the things that we're working through now is what's it look like if you come back in math this fall as a seventh and eighth grader? Traditionally, we've done some things that, that I feel like are a bit antiquated. Uh, you know, we predispose people to you're going to be in this group or that group. You're going to get seventh grade math where this group's going to get pre-algebra, which means in eighth grade, this group's going to get pre-algebra while this group gets algebra. And we've, we've, kind of, we've kind of really selected these groups too early on, in my opinion, and we need to be able to offer more higher level math, for example, to all of our kids and not predisposing some to something less or another group to something more. So I think we have a real, a real opportunity when kids come back because all kids are going to be returning to us with gaps. And how can we work through all kids in seventh grade math, then transition second semester to pre-algebra? Then in the eighth grade, that would be a semester of block time in pre-algebra where possibly more kids can have algebra in that second uh, semester. So those are the things that we really think that we have an opportunity to reset and look creatively on how that we can we can really expand our upper level offerings to more students. So if you if you really subscribe to the fact that 90% of the future jobs are going to be STEM related, how can we only prep a small percentage of our group or of our students with those those higher level math uh, opportunities? Because if I predispose this group to not getting algebra until the end of the ninth grade year, then their access is going to be more limited as they complete their high school years versus someone that completed algebra as an eighth grader. So how we solve that and how we expand those upper level offerings to more kids, I think this has given us a great opportunity to think creatively how, how we do that. The other thing is for, for all my uh, English teaching colleagues, STEM and STEAM does not, does not mean that ELA and literacy is not important. You know, in our district, uh, that's something that we really have to, we have to continue to reiterate because when you talk about STEM and people think about science, technology, engineering, and math, they think that the ELA content, uh, that we're maybe putting that on the back burner. Never is there going to be a time that, that pre-K through four literacy and literacy throughout is more important. So, Again, when students come back, we have to think about how we assess those gaps, how we differentiate and continue to accelerate. One of the, one of the other things that I, I think, uh, if you've ever, if there's any golfers on the line, there's a great book uh, called Seven Days in Utopia, but they talk about the importance of creating artists. 
and take away the literal term of, of artist, but let's think about letting go of perfect. You know, how do we let go of perfect and how do we think about retooling with a different set of circumstances? And I really think that's the, the challenge that we have uh, in a in a in a COVID and post-COVID world. How as adults do we model these skills? How do we intentionally design learning and uh, opportunities to instill these skills in our students? Where we focus not on the way things have always been done, but what opportunities do we have to think critically and solve problems? of today different than what many of us experienced in the past. We need more artists. We need people who, who, you know, an artist, what I would define as folks who think creatively, paint a picture early despite the set of circumstances. Don't be deterred that we've been forced to change, but how can we embrace the post-COVID world and look at the opportunities we have to accelerate to better need our future employers' needs? I think that's really the challenge, and that goes back to mindset. One of the other keys that I think employers are going to be looking for and we're, we're gearing up for, employers want all employees to have some level uh, of leadership skill in, in understanding that, that our kids are all capable of being leaders. So we're really looking, uh, we're going to be using our uh, health and wellness funds next, next fall. We're going to begin the process of being a leader in me school. And we really think it's critical on top of these partnerships and how we've aligned with business and industry that we also start also start exposing all of our kids to the to to opportunities to become leaders and to step up and, and take those uh, opportunities. So that mindset of going away from the way things have always been done to that urgency of the need to do things different. So I'll close with this. I'm sitting on the back porch a couple of weeks ago with, without a doubt, with the greatest classroom teacher that I that I personally have witnessed in 33 years in the business. Uh, this person, uh, ironically, comes from a, a business and industry background, but I, I hired uh, I hired this person as a teacher uh, a number of years ago, and the conversation became quite emotional because, uh, as the story goes. He had been invited to a drive through wedding. And the reason that he had been invited to this wedding is because this student getting married had identified him as one of the five adults outside his family that had had the greatest influence on his life. And obviously that was touching. It was emotional. But the emotion really began, began to really uh, escalate when we think about the uncertainty of our future. The uncertainty that we've experienced and the uncertainty moving forward. And the educator started to discuss about, I need my kids. I need my kids back. I feed off my kids. I need these relationships. I need these opportunities that I can continue to have this type of influence, which I think, I think we would all agree. For, the, for most of us, it's exactly why we do what we do. But the, the conversation quickly turned when I said, well, why would next year be any different? You might have to engage your kids differently. Right? You might have to drive to their home. You might have to visit with them on the front porch. You might have to do this. You might have to do that. But the fact is, just in a post a COVID or post COVID world, those relationships, that influence has never the need for that's never been greater. How we deliver that, how we foster those relationships, might look vastly different. But the challenge leaving that conversation was we've identified the impact. We've identified the need moving forward. Delivery might certainly look different. How we accomplish this might look different uh, presently and in the future. But it doesn't take away the need. In fact, I would suggest because of these circumstances and because of this uncertainty, the need is actually greater. And I think the same is true with how we serve not just our community and students, but how we serve as partners to our business and industry uh, folks who are desperately needing trained employees to man their lines, to work in their facility, to produce their product. So with that being said, I'd just like to say thanks. I would like to, to challenge you to, to not use COVID uh, in the past or present or even in the future 
as an excuse to to become dejected. But let's look at that as a catalyst to to really make us think differently. Uh, you know, really to get back and think about how we uh, focus on customer focused innovation. And, you know, with our customers being not just our students and our families, but also our business and industry partners and really economic growth throughout our region and state. They need us to be focused, customer based, innovative thinkers. And we really need to grasp that and move things forward in an accelerated fashion. And I think people in our state need us to lead that effort, prepare kids with that model mindset because it's that mindset that our business and industry partners are going to need to move our state forward economically. So, hey, thanks to everybody that that stuck around. I know I stand between you and lunch. Uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions or comments or maybe Graham can provide some contact information if you'd like to contact me at some other point. Graham? Yeah, I would, I would definitely be glad to provide that contact information. And uh, one of the nice things about, uh, about you know, uh, a virtual conference is that maybe folks already are having lunch right now. You know, it's a little more flexible that way. We're not a, True. don't have that buffet option. Um, a lot of, thank you, uh, Dan, a lot of folks, you know, um, are going to say that, and I'm, I'm sure that's going to come through in the chat. Um, a couple questions, not many, uh, a couple of folks asking specifically to share that rubric that you mentioned. Um, if, if that's something that you'd be willing to share and, um, also, a request to share the um, the job description or the scope of work for the pathway specialist position that you described, um, just to get an idea of of you know if folks wanted to engage somebody like that, what what that job description might look like. Um, Is it best for me just to email those things to you, Graham? Um, yes, and then we can post them um, with with the resources as we uh, as we post that online. Um, that may be a couple days just to let everybody know until we can get everything posted online. The videos take a while um, to to finalize and then we'll 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 get them posted. Um, any other questions? Got a lot of a lot of thank yous coming in, but want to make sure that uh, anybody that does have questions gets their questions answered. Yeah, re really appreciate the message that you shared and and um, I think that you know where you closed is is the part that that sticks the most with me is that you know this this though it's a challenge uh this this pandemic um really is putting us in a position where uh we have to think differently and i think that's been kind of the the theme of the day is you know it started with what uh mr aiken said you know around flexibility and and talking through you know being innovative um and i think that's that's at the heart of everything that we're doing at this point in time is that we have to get creative and and we can't use this as an, as an excuse to not serve students, but rather take it as an opportunity to shift the way that we can we can serve students and try to personalize the way that we can serve students. So, yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else have questions? Okay, well, in lieu of any other questions, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time today and the opportunity to to share and uh, and and you know deliver your passion to the rest of us because I I know that's helpful as we shift from July into August and and right back to the uh, the school year. Um, a request for for the feedback form that would be in the sketch. Uh, so I will go ahead and post the link to our entire sketch again uh, in the chat. Um, but otherwise, this will bring our uh, our conference half day to an end. Um, just want to say thank you to everybody, um, especially those that shared and presented and and took time out of their uh, their day to to uh, prepare for this and to 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 share that. But also any uh, any that 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 have chosen to join us today thank you for for engaging uh because i this is you know taking advantage of this opportunity i know it's it's definitely not to the level that we'd like uh getting in person and and getting together to be able to to talk and and discuss but 
Um, I, I hope that this was still an incredibly valuable experience uh, for y'all. I know, I know it was for me uh, to be able to hear from you. And um, we look forward to the time when, when we can do this again, uh, hopefully next summer together uh, in person. Um, so with that, thank you all so much. Uh, we hope uh, that, that school goes great for, for all of you as we return and whatever that looks like and that everybody's staying safe and, uh, and making smart choices out there. Thank you. Thanks, Graham.